Ladies and gentlemen, we will now continue the uh, conference with a panel discussion on the management of climate and environmental risks. Allow me to refer to the widely, widely shared consensus that large sums of both public and private funds will be required to address the sustainability challenge. This need presents a huge opportunity for financiers and intermediaries that advise on these deals and, of course, developers too. In the second section of this event, we will search for opportunities surrounding green and sustainable finance. The moderator of this section will be a Singapore FinTech Festival ambassador and the other co-founder of CFTE, the Centre for Finance, Technology and Entrepreneurship, Mr. Hugh Guen Triel. Now, apart from these roles, he is also the CEO of the Disruptive Group, a business builder and advisory firm in innovation and finance. He is a fintech fellow at the Center for Global Finance and Technology at Imperial College and an entrepreneurship expert at Oxford said Entrepreneurship Center. He is also a member of ESMA's Consultative Working Group for Financial Innovation and a founding member of the Asian Supercharger, one of the largest fintech accelerators in Asia. Hugh, I now hand over to you uh, so you can introduce the topic and the members of your panel. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for joining this panel. Uh, I'm uh, really glad that we're having this discussion. It's part of the Impact Summit of the Singapore FinTech Festival. And uh, we've heard some very, very interesting discussions over the last few hours. Uh, there was a panel on financial inclusion. You know, that's definitely one of the part of impact. And you know, for this panel now, we will talk about another topic, which is climate and environmental risk. So that's the purpose of this topic. And I think what is interesting about this topic, and we've just heard you know, from the previous presentation, uh, in terms of you know, it's good for the banks, uh, it's good for uh, society in general, but I think that in the current environment, there are some questions that we have to ask ourselves. And the question is, you know, we can't really stop all our existing activities and just to focus on climate and environmental risk. At the same time, we're, we're having a huge pandemic and a health crisis. We're also entering into the worst, perhaps, recession ever. So how do we manage all those climate risks and environmental risks on top of this? Uh, so you're currently watching the Budapest stage uh, of the Singapore FinTech Festival, and we'll have speakers from all around the world. So let me introduce you know, all the different speakers. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we can see them. I can't see, uh, hopefully, you can see on the screen. Uh, but uh, the first speaker would be Shaba Kandrash. Can you see him on the screen? Hopefully you can see him, but let me introduce him first. Uh, so from Budapest, we have Shaba Kandrash, who's deputy governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, MNB. And uh, Shaba is responsible for the supervisory activities of the Central Bank. For the topic of today, which is around green finance and sustainable finance, he's part of MNB's senior management for all the sustainable finance policy. And as part of his role of, uh, on the EU side, he is responsible uh, and he is a representative of MNB's participation in the, the EU sustainable banking policy making. Uh, next, we have coming from New York, we have Yuval, and Yuval Roos is a co-founder and CEO of Digital Asset. And Digital Asset is a blockchain firm established in 2015. Yuval helped to raise $150 million in funding from different strategic investors, and they work with a lot of different organizations like ASX or VMware, for example. Prior to Digital, <laughs> Asset, Digital Asset, he was uh, part of Citadel and DRW uh, Trading, and uh, for this topic today, for sustainability, he's part of different forums, including the World Economic Forum or Interworld Alliance, for example. Now let me jump to the other side of the world and to Korea and Seoul, where uh, I'm very happy to welcome Susan. So Susan Pedersen is the Assistant Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI. She's also the head of investment policy solutions at GGGI. 
And GGI is responsible for providing technical support and services in green investment and policy for governments around the world. She's been in that space for a long time, she's been working for the last 25 years in basically trying to catalyze and helping catalyze partnerships and technology transfers in this field of environmental and climate change. And uh, not too far from you, Suzanne, uh, in Shanghai, we have Charles. Uh, so Charles is a deputy dean of academics and professor of finance at Kudan University. Uh, he worked uh, on a lot of different topics, from fintech to investment, corporate finance, and behavioral finance. Uh, he's very, very widely quoted top journals. And on top of this, uh, he also helped to establish the Fintech Research Center in 2018 and has been its director since. So I'm very glad to have all those experts coming from all around the world. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I also want to make this session very, very interactive. So on your screen, you can ask questions. I can see the questions that you ask. So please make sure that you ask questions. And as I told in our speakers, let's try to make it you know, as you know, interactive and engaging for everyone as possible. Uh, so we will try not to have long monologues of five minutes, but much more a real dialogue between all of us. So first, uh, I would have a question for Shaba. And uh, Shaba, so I can see you now. Uh, great to Hi. see you. So first question for you, uh, and you know, let's start with the foundation, because we'll talk about you know, responsible finance, sustainable finance, but for a lot of people, they don't really know what it is. So my first question is that MNB, you are an official endorser of the UN's principle for responsible banking. But what is responsible banking and what does it mean concretely for you at MNB? Thank you very much, and uh, it's a great honor to be here and uh, be part of this uh, panel. And yes, indeed, with the support of our Financial Stability Council, we became an official supporter of the principles for responsible banking early this year. And the principles uh, expect the signatory banks to align their business uh, models and the business uh, strategy uh, with the with the goal of the environmental uh, with the goal of the sustainable development uh, to reduce their socially and uh, environmentally harmful impacts and to strengthen uh, positive effects in line with that uh, the the signing banks need to do a deep analysis uh, of uh, their current impact on the environment and see where they can make uh, progress. And uh, as an official supporter, uh, the MMB, the Hungarian Central Bank, we encourage our uh, banks and the financial um, institution to, to sign these uh, principles and uh, make a, a very uh, uh, deep and uh, powerful commitment, but a realistic uh, one. And therefore, uh, to encourage them, we also uh, integrate the principles into our new uh, outcoming uh, green recommendation. And, uh, and uh, therefore, officially, we try to push the banks uh, towards this uh, direction. So we try to be... Uh, we try to use uh, as tool as we have and try to be very innovative. Thank you very much, uh, Shabas. I think it's a good way you know, to start in terms of setting the foundations. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a question to uh, Suzanne, because, of course, you know, we have you know, all those different you know, objectives you know, we'd like you know, to... Uh, I know for a bank, you know, I guess, you not know, to make money, you know, for, you know, to do good, you know, for the environment. Uh, but how do we do it you know, uh, concretely? And especially, you know, in this environment, which is a challenging environment from a health standpoint, economic standpoint, uh, how do we reconcile, you know, those different you know, objectives? Well, that's, uh, of course, a big uh, question for everyone. But I think we're in one of those uh, once-in-a-lifetime uh, moments where we can address the global challenges of climate change, environmental degradation and social inclusion, while also uh, addressing the economic crisis. 
Not to address these dimensions together would be a mistake. Uh, without bold actions, uh, consequences would be uh, devastating for our future uh, if we don't act on climate change. And uh, of course, the economy will be harmed eventually. We find in a way that the ongoing development of Green New Deal policies uh, in, for instance, the EU, China, the Republic of Korea are very promising and uh, offer opportunity for governments to link climate action to their development plans and COVID-19 recovery plans. You can even sort of uh, talk about uh, a race to net zero at the moment. Uh, GDDI is an intergovernmental organization uh, uh, working with uh, 38 member states uh, and with presence in more than 40 countries. And our mission is to support country governments transition to a model of economic growth that is also environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive. So we do find uh, that it is possible to do both at the same time. But of course, there's need for robust uh, research to identify the most efficient pathways to deliver the Paris Agreement goals and climate neutrality. So as such, we are, are working uh, to support countries in uh, planning their climate transition using a robust economic-wide modeling and systems approaches. And for instance, right now in Hungary, we are uh, completing a study for the Hungarian government that informed the planning uh, efforts towards carbon neutrality by 2050. The results are actually showing that the climate transition is also leading to an increased GDP, to green jobs creation, and a number of co-benefits such as improved air quality and restored biodiversity. And actually, McKinsey has just come out in 2020 with a new report that are also reaching similar conclusions uh, for Europe, especially that uh, Europe can reach uh, net zero emissions at net zero cost. So I think that's uh, really interesting. And of course, green recovery uh, in this trying uh, time is an important area of action for GGGI. So we are also working to uh, help with uh, the governments that we work for in greening their uh, recovery packages. And um, we have also uh, published our own uh, report this year that contained uh, recommendations for governments to design their recovery packages and deliver climate action as well. Uh, it's called Achieving Green Growth and Climate Action Post-COVID-19. Uh, I could get into many, many examples of what we're doing, but in the interest of time, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Suzanne. So you're saying that uh, green actually could uh, be a factor of growth. So it doesn't have you know, uh, to be you know, two different things. Uh, but so how do we do it? Uh, and perhaps, you know, uh, of course, you know, we're, we're part of the Singapore FinTech Festival. So we'll talk a lot about you know, FinTech and innovations. Uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, Charles, you know, what do you think? You know, what kind of you know, uh, uh, innovation you know, can help you know, this uh, green recovery? Yeah, I, I'm going to probably step all over you, Val, to answer as well. I'm such a big fan of what digital asset does. But I actually really think that asset digitization and tokenization is actually a, a core, core part to it. You know, so much of finance is about connecting value um, with investment and matching risk and reward and so forth. And traditionally, when we look at the big um, infrastructure deals, when we look at hydropower, um, you're talking about five, 10 years of capital expenditure before you start to even begin to sniff what would be called a financial return. And, and that's why the big financial investors are no longer interested in these kind of projects. Um, and, and in a lot of the emerging economies, you know, that's why it's so hard to think sustainability um, and green tech, um, you know, for lack of that sort of kickstart um, to get us moving. Um, but if we move to a world where tokenization and blockchain are now enabling ecosystem finance, where we're moving away from a mega, uh, be it global bank or investment bank or even a world bank IMF, 
when we're moving away from them cutting a hundred million dollar check and being able to look to our ecosystems and say, you know, who's going to capture the value of this green tech? When I build a hydro plant, who's going to benefit from that clean energy? And can we get the local ecosystem to be part of that fundraise? And suddenly we see people who have long-term views of value creation within the economy are now engaged in that investment practice and we're less reliant or potentially not reliant at all on you know, the, the pure financial investors, which may have, um, and rightfully so, some responsibilities to their investors and to their shareholders for short-term return, um, but that sometimes you know, don't, don't, aren't able to sort of dovetail with the needs of, of the green and sustainable development. And then we we'll go further beyond that, and we think about how do we enable ultra-small businesses? How do we do microfinancing in emerging economies? And, and interestingly, the solution is still the same. If we're able to, to leverage fintech and things like blockchain to generate tra super transparent transactions and able to share in a meaningful way what those are actual value a chain look like, where is the business coming in and out? And we're able to verify that. Now, all of a sudden, these small and even micro businesses that look very risky uh, from an investment perspective, all of a sudden, you know, I have that comfort level to say, oh, well, I can see what's going on. I can see their invoices and, and so forth and their accounts receivable going forward. And suddenly that opaqueness that's characteristic of so many emerging markets um, it is gone. Right. And suddenly the honest business person has access to capital markets they never saw before. And the dishonest person, of course, is removed from the economy. And, and, and you, know, you have to argue that that's good for everybody. So, um, you know, I think, you know, leveraging these technologies to bring into the concept of ecosystem financing um, and that transparency and the risk reduction that these technologies provide. I think that's a great first step. And I think we're ready to make that step pretty soon. So, what do you think, Yuval? So, I guess Noah, you share the same view on blockchain. So, first of all, thank you, Charles, for that tee up. It was actually really good. So, I, I think that first of all, when we think about when we think about uh, sustainable finance, that the idea is, can we actually create value while thinking about sustainability without destruction? And I think that before we even get into some of the things that we can do going forward, I think it's actually important to note there has been plenty of studies that compare the, the financial return of companies that are thinking about social good or about sustainability. And it's already been proven that they outperform their peers. Um, so already, already from a brand perspective, companies that are thinking about sustainability should be aware that from a brand and customer perspective are going to have uh, better returns. That, that's already been shown. So that's, for me, already a good sign uh, for the future. Second of all, I think that if you think about what Suzanne said, we have a financial crisis and I think it's a great opportunity, no different than like in the, in the Great Depression, it was a great opportunity to create infrastructure in order to stimulate the economy. I think that there's a great opportunity here to stimulate the economy while thinking about sustainability, thinking about how do we use this opportunity to create a more sustainable future. So that's just generally speaking, some things that, that I think we should think about. But at the end of the day, I think in order to create a more sustainable future, it can come from different places. So I think governments can take a very active role uh, in terms of regulation, but I would actually uh, call for more positive regulation rather than you must do this, which usually gets circumvented a lot of times, right? People find loopholes, how to, how to break rules or, or achieve the rules, not in the original intention, but actually think about positive reinforcement type of regulation. If you have done something that can be proven that was good for the economy or was good for the environment, there will be a positive economic return for you as a company. And I think that generally speaking, we find those uh, historically um, um, more motivating and actually more successful at creating a positive impact. So that's, I think, how governments can be uh, extremely helpful. And we're seeing a lot of government initiatives that are trying to do exactly that. But I think on the private sector, to Charles' point, I do think that if you think about sustainability, 
it's not an individual task. It's not an individual corporation task, right? At the end of the day, if you're starting to look at the trend of net neutrality by a lot of the big uh, players, Amazon, Microsoft, all of these players that are calling to be net neutral, their footprint, their impact is, is not just Microsoft itself or, or any of those companies. It's their entire supply chain. It's their customer base. It's, it's so many big interactions. And in order to create these networks that can actually create sustainable finance, you want to think about data sharing, right? And, and real-time data sharing. And that's why I agree with Charles that the idea of using blockchain and tokenization is a really good way to start achieving that. Now, to me, tokenization is synonymous with standardization, right? Because to have an asset, to tokenize an asset, you have to agree on that asset. And one of the biggest issues I see today in sustainable finance is lack of on standards or some kind of agreement. How do we how do we actually offset uh, carbon? Uh, what are the type of assets that we can offset? How do you offset that? That's one aspect, standardization. But the other part, and Charles started touching on it, real-time data, there's a lot of fraud that exists in, for example, in carbon markets. So we believe that the usage of blockchain technology and tokenization can really accelerate uh, the, the initiatives around what we would call verifiable carbon offsets, right? So you could actually validate that if you are purchasing a carbon offsetting product, that same product wasn't sold to you know, 20 other customers that all think they offset their uh, carbon footprint by a certain amount, but actually realize that uh, the same product was sold to too many. And that still exists today. And I think that using um, uh, blockchain technology and smart contracts, you could really drive a much better uh, infrastructure for net neutrality. No, thanks a lot. And, and uh, I guess you know, between the two of you, that's really interesting in terms of you know, what you mentioned in terms of you know, the need for transparency and you know data sharing uh, and you know here we talk about you know uh, I guess you no know, renew innovations uh, wanted to go back to perhaps you know, something which is you no know, less you know, on, on that stage of you know blockchain but you know green bonds because we hear a lot about green bonds uh, and wanted to hear you know Susan's views on that you know which is you no know, what are green bonds you know today you know what's the impact uh, is there really an impact or not and you know what are the next steps for green bonds um, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, let's say uh, green bonds has been around for uh, at least uh, some time, but uh, compared to the uh, normal uh, market, uh, you could say uh, it's it's still net. Uh, it's very small. It's only about maybe one trillion US dollars in 2020 compared to the global bond market size of, you know, more than 128 <laughs> trillion. So it, it's definitely uh, small. And uh, we, uh, as an institution, have uh, certainly started working on this. But uh, many of our uh, developing countries, emerging uh, economy uh, governments, uh, it's still pretty new to them. So we are more sort of working on uh, lifting the barriers in various ways, you know, de developing policy guidelines, regulatory frameworks, pilots and green bonds, uh, issuance, et cetera, enhancing the, the enabling environment and, and so forth. There are definitely uh, many other countries, uh, certainly in Europe and elsewhere that have a uh, great experience in, in this area, but we, we see it just being an emerging sort of area for, for our work. So uh, uh, it could be very interesting. It's certainly one of the ways to, uh, let's say, catalyze uh, access to climate finance and green investments. But, you know, we also looking at more sort of traditional, um, let's say, uh, uh, methodologies, you know, developing national financing vehicles that are capable of blending international and domestic capital, we, we have quite some experience with um, national financing vehicle design and oper operationalization in Colombia, Ethiopia, Mongolia, Rwanda, Senegal, et cetera. And also just uh, basically uh, uh, developing, uh, you know, um, green bankable projects that attract uh, in both 
public-private investments uh, in sectors such as renewable energy, waste to resources, etc. But uh, we are experimenting certainly with the green bonds and uh, uh, hopefully we will uh, be able to show many more results later on. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, anybody has any other views on, uh, on green bonds? Uh, so I think you do have a view, Yuval, but we can't hear you. Yep. I think I think that, uh, sorry about that, I think that um, that green bonds is a very important initiative, but but to my taste, they're not green enough. Um, uh, to me, they're, they're, they're just bonds uh, that have have a, a, you know, a shade of green to them. And 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 really and really, um, if if we want to really think about green bonds as as a way to raise capital for a sustainable future, uh, what I would like to see is more and more bonds having restrictive covenants that are actually measuring the impact of that bond, um, because at the end of the day, and and that the return on the bond is adjusted uh, to the outcome of the bond. So let's just take a very easy example. If you're if you're um, uh, if you are trying to raise money to build uh, uh, you know some kind of power plant a windmill for example um, you know there's the time to market how fast am I going to start producing that green energy are you on time did you actually deliver it uh, how much energy are you going to provide how much are you going to give back into the grid all kinds of things that are part of your project that's what you're selling to your investors and to actually hold hold the, the borrower to some covenants uh, that are um, tracking the, the, the plan, the project. I would like to see those kind of things in green bonds. And, and that's where it goes back to Charles' point around technology, right? You can't start doing those kind of things without inclusion of technology. So how do you connect, for example, um, uh, IoT devices into these projects that feed back into a very, uh, very uh, transparent uh, system that can actually prove to your lenders that you are actually performing according to the project and we don't need to run an audit on whoever's borrowing the money. So really streamline these kind of infrastructure plays, I think will give uh, a massive push to, in my opinion, a very good idea that, that really haven't even reached its, uh, its, uh, it, you know, its potential, not even close. Well, uh, thanks, I'll you just jump in if I may. Um, yeah, you know, ahead, and you all, I mean, that, that, that all comes to that third party validation once again, right? And, and that, that now comes into, you know, uh, I think back to the really primitive forms of, uh, public governance, things like Amber Alert in the United States, right? Whereby, you know, a handful of police officers, how can they track the whole of the state? But millions of smartphone users, all with video and phone capabilities and, ca and camera capabilities, can do all sorts of outreach and all sorts of monitoring that you know a, a, a you know a regular law enforcement agency can never do. Um, but but I also wanted to speak to your point on that positive sort of less punitive view of the role of the regulator. You know, one of the things that that we've been doing and one of the um, uh, projects that have been working on has been with the Kingdom of Bhutan. Um, and, and I think maybe some people have heard of, you know, they have this sort of um, uh, happiness uh, uh, profile, right? This gross domestic happiness concept. Um, really, though, that, that, that's not just sitting around all day and, and smiling at home, right? That's a combination of a lot of things. That's a combination of rest hours, work hours, pension, personal health. Um, of course, environmental impact and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we've been working with um, uh, with their government to do is to, on the one hand, look at sustainable energy, and of course, their geo, you know, their geographic position gives them all sorts of opportunities with hydro and and others, but also to work with that gross um, domestic happiness concept. And can we tokenize this in a meaningful way and actually make it into a virtual commodity? Um, that now, as you said, if you're doing good for sustainability, you're now receiving these tokens, which have a actual tradable value um, within the economy of Bhutan that might buy you carbon credits, that might buy you fuel, 
um, that might buy you tax releases, that might earn you um, agricultural subsidies, you know, all these sort of things that now can be connected together and not at all in a punitive way, but rather in sort of a reward mechanism. And, you know, they've been doing this happiness thing for some time. So they actually have their own accounting system for this already. And for us, all we really need to do to me is sort of a, you know, it's really a simple task of bringing the, um, you know, the IT infrastructure into place, the validation into place, um, and, and helping them to build out that token economy upon, again, a construct that they already believe in and that already exists and that we can enable in a very, very powerful way. So I just wanted to say I, I really enjoy that idea of having a positive feedback role rather than you know, being simply punitive. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Charles. So we went from green bonds you know, to the need you know, to have something you know, which is more than you know, what we have today to uh, how to tokenize happiness. Uh, and Shaba, what do you think about it? Do you have a view also on, on green bonds that can take us even further? Yeah, uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, uh, Juva mentioned that uh, the importance of the, the governments and uh, uh, next to the governments, uh, I, I think the, the central banks also could have uh, uh, some role to to facilitate uh, the, the the green finance and of course uh, uh, green bonds it's, it could be uh, part of that uh, uh, in terms of the central bank somehow uh, give guidance and 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 maybe a little bit more uh, to to help uh, to improve this uh, this green uh, bonds uh, market also and for instance here in uh, Hungary the the sustainable finance is yet uh, as Susan also mentioned, is just a small but 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 very growing uh, segment, and uh, and uh, this is this is uh, one way uh, where we can uh, uh, go, and uh, and I think uh, as a central bank uh, we could uh, facilitate this whole process, uh, and 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 let me talk about a little bit what uh, uh, what we are doing here as a central bank uh, in Hungary, because maybe it could give you or, or anybody else uh, uh, a good example because, because we would like to uh, uh, really, really uh, broadcast uh, the, the green finance, the whole green issue towards the, uh, our uh, financial institutions. And to do that, uh, we, we decided that uh, we create a very, very uh, structured uh, approach. And that's why we created a a green strategy uh, to the central bank and it has three pillars the first pillar is that we we try to define what kind of tools we have for instance how we can uh, encourage uh, and and help to and promote the the green bonds uh, market uh, we try to define our uh, natural tools which, which what can uh, help uh, the institutions and and there is another one for instance the capital requirements what uh, what a, a supervisory authority can uh, define the second pillar is that that we try to uh, find out partners uh, for instance uh, this uh, conference and and other partners ggi and and the uh, united nations and etc uh, to build a community uh, where we can discuss the different approaches uh, and and of course uh, from the market point of view from the central bank point of view the government point of view we can uh, understand each other in a in a better way and 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 and, and try to find out the the win-win solutions and the third pillar is not just uh, saying but but doing uh, something uh, that's why we we launched uh, a program uh, where we reduce our carbon emission and within the next two years we would like to reduce uh, our carbon emission by 30 percentage and and uh, the next uh, five years we would like to reduce uh, 80 percentage and we would like to become the first or maybe uh, somewhere in the first place uh, uh, as a central bank who works as a, a net zero emission uh, central bank so these are an, an, an overall picture, maybe a little bit more than just a green bond, but in my point of view, green bond is 
one part of this whole uh, complex uh, 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 platform and, and we have to find out the good solution. This is my personal opinion. Uh, thanks a lot, Shaba. And that, uh, that was really clear. I think that was really good you know, to uh, separate that into you know, the tools. And we talked about you know, different you know, tools which are available. I think there's a point that came back from a lot of you, which is the, the ecosystem uh, and the fact that everybody you know, has a role and uh, everybody you know, can have a leverage and an influence. Uh, and, uh, and the part about you know, doing it yourself. Uh, I like the part which I think you know, nobody mentioned until you mentioned it, which is no capital requirements. Uh, I used to be in a bank you know, before, and you know, there's a lot of talk that we can have. But once we discuss about capital requirements, then you know, that does no focus, no the effort. And uh, perhaps uh, I see that we're running out of time. So I'd like to ask a last question, which is you know, there's a lot of different players and actors you know, in that space. And so we can all do something around it. But uh, a, a theoretical question, if you could be anyone in any organization, anywhere in the world, who would you be and what would you do to have the most impact on sustainability? And perhaps, no, let me start with uh, Suzanne. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I am actually pleased to be in a way where I am right now because, uh, you know, the mission of uh, the work that we do with the member governments is uh, really important and uh, certainly also in the green recovery uh, situation. So I, I think uh, for the time being, uh, I'm happy being part of uh, one of those organizations uh, working for, you know, the greater good, <laughs> maybe uh, not uh, only for profit, uh, not that I disrespect that in any way. I worked in the private sector for 20 years myself, but uh, it's also nice to be uh, in, in a do good type of organization. So I'm, I'm actually quite happy about that. <laughs> so I'm sure others have more exciting aspirations. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks a lot, Susan. I just hope that not everybody will just say, I'm very happy to be who I am. So you, you <laughs> what do you think? I will say that I'm very happy to be where I am, but but if I if I answer the question of, of where, where I would I choose, listen, at the end of the day, I think that the, the reality about this space is that by doing and actually leading by example, you could create a massive movement. So some of the things that Charles talked about, that Susan talked about, those are all great examples. And, and the more we have of those, uh, the more we have of those, uh, we will see positive impact. So if you ask me, choose one organization, it would have to look something like one of those mega companies because I think their footprint touches so many of the aspects of sustainability. If you think about supply chain, energy. So take any big of the Google, the Amazon, the Alibaba, just think about their footprint from an energy perspective, from a supply chain perspective, recycling perspective. It just touches so many different elements uh, around a sustainable future. So I would want to be a head of sustainability uh, to achieve net neutrality at one of those organizations, I think would be super exciting job to do. Thanks, you are. That's great. Charles, what, uh, what would be your, your choice? I, I don't know. I, I might not mind being a founder at CFTE. <laughs> so that might not be a bad place to start. Um, but I think I'd go Yuval's path. I, I don't know if I would say private or public sector, but I would want to be doing something global. Uh, I think, you know, when we talk about ecosystem finance and these sort of things, I mean, these are cross-border plays. These are plays where everybody has to work together. I mean, it just it doesn't do a whole lot of good. If, if only one country is doing it and everybody around them isn't, it, it just doesn't solve the problem or, or any of the meaningful problems that are out there. So I would want to be on some kind of a global platform um, and, and able to uh, impact global ecosystems. That might, fight, that might be through global supply chains. It might be through geopolitics. But, but I think having a, um, you know, a commitment to cooperation um, and thinking about things from a very macro level and from, a very, again, a very long term view. And, and again, when we look at a lot of financial policies, and, and I'm not talking about any particular country, but, you know, it can be very myopic, you know, some of the politics insisted, right? You know, every three or four years, we, you know, you need to focus on, on, you know, maintaining your position as a politician, rather than thinking about maybe solving some of the problems that sit before. So, you know, I think anything, you know, position that might behoove itself to having a, a more of a long term view, 
uh, more of a global view um, and, and somewhere where, you know, we can, you know, focus upon be, being a compass for others. You know, um, I'd love to be in a position to do it myself, but I would also think it's important to be a compass and be able to sort of point the way and, and have people say, okay, well, yeah, let's do that. You know, let's all get together and let's all do that. Um, you know, and having some kind of a, I don't know, uh, what's the word, the um, invisible hand kind of kind of role, I suppose, <laughs> wouldn't be so bad. Um, but again, as everyone else said, happy to be where I am now um, as well. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Charles. So, Shavon, you had a bit more time to think. You know, what, you know, what would be your choice? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a really, I really like this uh, creative uh, question. Uh, and I, I would, as a central banker, I would rather not uh, step uh, in the shoes on, uh, on uh, step in the shoes of uh, anybody else, because as a central banker, we like to live uh, our own uh, world. But, uh, but uh, uh, this is not the, the way how we we organize ourselves. Uh, so, and uh, and I, I just uh, can join to the others that uh, that uh, I am okay with the. the the place where I am uh, right now, due to the reason that I think, uh, which is very important, uh, to to change uh, your mindset, uh, to change your mindset as a person, as an institution, as a country, as a whole. So, uh, if you have a chance uh, to to do something personally in your private life, to to create, to 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 facilitate the the, the green ideas. Uh, you have to do it, and uh, and I'm very very uh, honored, and and I'm very very delighted that uh, I'm as a deputy governor. I have a chance to influence uh, uh, to the to a whole institution and and a, a very very uh, important institution as a central bank, and and I would like to catalyze uh, the whole central banks and through the whole central bank, whole Hungary uh, to. To move towards this uh, direction, because somebody told before uh, the outbreak of one of the the, the possible uh, chance to outbreak uh, uh, from this present situation is is to define new uh, new economical uh, 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 approaches and 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 I think green uh, uh, sustainable finances is is a perfect perfect way uh, where. Uh, we can go, and and I hope that uh, whole Hungary can uh, can follow this path. Thanks a lot, Shabazz. and I think that's a great message to end uh, this panel, uh, which is that each of us you know, can have a role, and each of us you know, can move our organization to have a role. And at the end, we discuss about a lot of the tools which are available. There's a lot of innovation to be done in in that space. It seems like we don't have to choose between you know, economy and green. We don't have to choose between health and green. You know, at the end of the day, it can be good you know, for the planet, but it can be good for society and companies also. So thank you very much, you know, of course, you know, to our speakers. Uh, thank you very much to MNB, and thank you very much to all of you, audience. And uh, have a very, very good end of the Singapore FinTech Festival. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. <laughs> You and all the members of the panel, I'd uh, like to thank you all for your truly informative and forward-seeing thoughts on these issues.